2 Timothy chapter 4, please follow along. I'm, I'm going to read verses 9 through 18. 2 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the way that you are the one who enables us and strengthens us. And I pray as we look in your word tonight, I pray that this truth will come home to our hearts in a fresh way, in a real way, as we seek to be a testimony for thee. Thank you, Father, that the gospel not only has gone forth into all the world, but even has gone down through time. So many Gentiles, including us today, hearing the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, to know and to have received the blessed gift of salvation. Bless our study tonight. We give thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you thankful that the Apostle Paul stood and gave testimony before the Emperor of Rome? Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful that he was faithful to God's calling? Saul of Tarsus became the Apostle Paul, obeyed the Spirit of God that spoke through a church in Antioch, to go, I want you to take the gospel and I want this to go out to all the Gentiles. And by God's grace and for his purpose and for his glory, here we are, 2024, and we're not alone. I don't mean just here. I mean many people who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. What a day it's going to be around the throne of God when all are gathered together around the throne to worship the Lamb. Amen? What a day it will be. Tonight I want to look at this passage, specifically at verses 17 and 18. Well, it's a topical study. We'll be looking at some other verses together. But the Lord stood with Paul to strengthen Paul. I don't know about you, but the, the truth of God's enabling grace, his strength in our lives. For Paul, the application was very real, and I want it to come home to our hearts, not just to get me through my trials. We want that, praise the Lord but to open my mouth and speak of my Savior, Jesus Christ, that others may know. Now, you may be aware of who was the emperor of Rome at this time. According to history, it was Nero. Paul stood before wicked Nero. He's not the first. He's not the last. He's not the only wicked Gentile emperor. emperor. There's been a sadly a long list of wicked leaders, even today in our day and time. And yet, here, Paul was called to bear testimony, not once, but more than once. In verse 16, at Paul's first defense, and he was looking forward to, he was going to have to do it again. Speak before Nero, and that he, Nero, might hear the gospel. I wonder what that must have been like. I, I just can't even imagine what that was like for wicked Nero to hear the gospel of the grace of God. But God wanted Nero to hear it, not just Nero, Everyone that was in his court there before uh, 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 Caesar's Rome, uh, judgment seat there in Rome, Paul shared the gospel. Now this is, as we uh, see in verses 8 and 7, uh, all the way back to verse 6, the very end, Paul understands this is the end of his earthly journey. His pilgrimage is coming to a close. He said in verse 6, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. What a picturesque expression 
the Spirit of God gave to Paul. The Old Testament drink offering, when they would pour it out on top of the sacrifice, they would pour out the drink offering. And Paul saw his life as now being poured out. God had spared his life on many an occasion, stoned and left for dead. He said that he uh, uh, stood with lions, apparently, at Ephesus. Uh, there was the whole crowd and mob, and he wanted to go in, and the believers wouldn't let him go in. Paul was shipwrecked. On and on it goes. Now he's before Nero, but he has a sense. He's been in a Roman prison. He's been released. He's back in a Roman prison again, now to stand before Nero, and he has a sense that this now is his time. My departure is at hand. And so his testimony, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, the day of judgment, not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What a wonderful testimony that as we are anxious to see our Savior, Jesus Christ, that there is a crown of righteousness laid up for us as we look forward to our blessed hope. And so Paul said, even though everyone departed from him, and there's a great time of departure in Paul's life going on right now, it's a tremendous place of loneliness that God has put Paul in. Notice in verse 10, as I read, Demas had forsaken him. The others were going out for ministry, but my understanding here with this word, uh, Demas is departing, and uh, he's departing because, for whatever reason, he's no longer interested in standing with Paul here. And, uh, and that's not the only case of it. If you turn back to chapter 1 and verse 15, in 2 Timothy 1.15, Paul says to Timothy, This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Let's think of all these churches that Paul was involved in planting and strengthening and helping them to grow, teaching them in the word of God. And now at this point, they're all turning away from Paul. Departure. It's a temptation for loneliness that Paul is experiencing. And yet the apostle Paul says in verse 17, but the Lord stood with me and the Lord strengthened me. And we see here that the strength that the Lord Jesus Christ brought into Paul's life and ministry was his own presence. The Lord stood with me. And Paul experienced this on more than one occasion. Turn to Acts chapter 18. When we go to the book of Acts in chapter 18, we go back to the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, specifically when he was in Corinth. And when Paul was in Corinth, once again, tremendous time of tribulation. Notice, I'll be picking up in verse 2 of this chapter, Acts 18, verse 2. Paul found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So people are coming to Christ. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, think of Philippi, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Now this has been a constant source of strife and opposition in Paul's ministry is when Jesus is presented as the Messiah, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament scriptures, even the Savior of the world. This is what the book of Hebrews is presenting, the same truth that Paul here shared and uh, Corinth in that area. And notice that when he did that, verse 6, they opposed him and blasphemed. He shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean, for now on I will go to the Gentiles. It's not the first time Paul said this statement, but he made it clear to the Jews, even as Jesus told his disciples. Remember when Jesus sent them out by twos, and he said, if they don't receive you in a particular town, and Jesus said, he said, take your sandals off and shake the dust off your sandals, as a testimony against them. That's a similar type thing of what Paul's doing here. The Jews understood this. In other words, a prophet had been sent to them. This is a New Testament prophet, but it's the same as the Old Testament prophet, just like when Jesus sent out in the twos. And if you rejected God's prophet, for the people of Israel, there was a serious accountability because they had the word of God that gave them the uh, requirements and the, the, the criteria that fulfilled. And Paul fulfilled that criteria. 
And so Paul says, I'm going to the Gentiles. So notice, he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue where Paul was reasoning. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. It's interesting how when a certain key individual turns to the Lord, how the Spirit of God will use that person, that testimony. It's a part of what God is doing. It's not the person. It's God. But God works through people. God works through people like you and people like me. He works through us. And that's what happens with Crispus. And so then comes the resistance. But before it, the Lord prepares Paul. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by vision, saying, Do not be afraid, but speak. And do not keep silent. Here it is. For I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God to them. And then comes the tremendous opposition and persecution. And again, it came from the Jews. And uh, it's interesting, by the way, when, when Gallio, the Roman uh, leader there, the governor, had no interest in dealing with these matters. We see that in verse 14. Gallio says, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Now notice, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. And you will read the book of Corinthians opens up with our dear brother Sosthenes' name. <laughs> How he was a faithful servant and he endured tremendous persecution for the name and the testimony of Jesus Christ. But the Lord Jesus Christ had prepared Paul for this, appearing to him, telling him, Paul, you're not going to be taken and killed. I am with you. I am with you. These are wonderful words that God speaks to his children. Jesus spoke it to all of us. He said to his disciples to go into all the world, preach the gospel, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17, that was the strength that the Lord was giving to Paul, is that the Lord was with him. It was the presence of God together with Paul, to strengthen Paul as he stood before Nero to share the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. Now turn with me, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I want to draw to your attention verse 12. Paul opens up his first epistle that he writes to Timothy. And he says, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. In verse 12, I want to draw your attention to the word enabled, enabled me. It's the same word that we have in 2 Timothy 4.17, strengthened. It means to strengthen, to give God's strength. Now here, Paul's talking about the beginning of his ministry. When Saul of Tarsus trusted in Jesus Christ as his Savior, and then he went through a period of time of God's working in his life for three years before God eventually it was through Barnabas, had him come to Antioch, and he got involved in the equipping of the saints there in Antioch, and then eventually from there is sent out with Barnabas on the first missionary journey. The Apostle Paul said it was the Lord Jesus Christ who enabled Paul. And I want you to notice here in verse 14 that that enablement was the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceedingly abundant. God's grace was great in the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, on Wednesday nights in the Old Testament, we've been looking at the grace of God, and we've defined God's grace as his favor. That is God shining his favor, his goodness, his kindness. If you're looking for a simple word to understand grace, think of the word help, help, God's help. 
And grace is not limited to the word help. It's just a word to help you to understand. We are to go to God for grace. What is grace? Well, some people define grace as God giving you what you don't deserve. It's absolutely that. We don't deserve it. But it's God's blessing. And it's, a, it's an expression of his kindness that God gives, his favor, the shining of his countenance upon his children. And God gives grace. And that comes in so many forms. That's why I like the general word help. And uh, I've warned us more than once, be careful when you pray, don't limit God in your prayers. Don't limit God. Make sure you ask God for grace. We may come boldly to his throne of grace that we may ask for his grace to help us in our time of need. If you ask God for grace, you're saying, Lord, I recognize that you have all wisdom. I recognize you have all power. And you happen to know what is the right answer, what I need in this situation. I might think I need this pain to stop, or I need this person to get right with God, or I need the situation to change, I need a job, I need, you know, we fill in the blanks too easily. And God knows that he could do so much more if we would just trust him. Lord, I'm in this situation, I need your grace. In other words, I'm open to whatever answer you may have. And let me tell you, when you begin to pray faithfully like that, looking for God's grace, you will see how God loves to answer prayers in a way that you never would have imagined. But it's a powerful demonstration of the hand of God in your life. Come and ask for grace. Now, Paul says to Timothy in verse 14, as I got going in the ministry, I'm thankful. God enabled me, verse 12, and it was the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that was exceedingly abundant in my life. We might wonder what made Paul the kind of preacher that he was. We know the answer. It's the grace of God. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. I want you to see it in your Bible. What made the Apostle Paul such a man who could endure the kind of persecution that he endured? Some people will probably say, well, Paul was a special guy. I'm just not, I'm not cut out of that same cloth. I'm not of that same material. I'm not of that caliber or quality. You're thinking all wrong when we think that kind of thing. And we tend to do that. We look at ourselves on a horizontal plane and we compare ourselves with one another. And we do God a great disservice when we do that. It's foolishness. We need to look to God and open up our hearts to receive his grace in our life to make us all that he wants us to be. And let me tell you, God has so much planned for each and every one of his children, far more than we can comprehend if we are willing to open our hearts and turn our lives over to him. God's grace. Here it is, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Now, isn't this the great resurrection chapter? Amen, it is. Why is Paul talking about God's grace in his life in the great resurrection chapter? Because Paul could not even conceive that Saul of Tarsus would be one of the key witnesses to the resurrected Messiah. But he was. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God. Paul understood that it's not me, it's not my teaching I received at the feet of Gamaliel. Did God use that in his life? Undoubtedly. All that you are, all that we are, in our makeup, in our background, and what family you were born in, what school you attended, what country you grew up in, what language you know, whether you were rich or poor, all of these things God has in his hand, and I'm telling you, it's nothing to him. God saved you because you are the person he wants to work in your life to accomplish his purpose for his glory. And so he wants to give you his grace. That's what Paul said. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all. Now watch this. This is not pride, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. In other words, God's grace enabled me, and I'm telling you, Paul said, I got up and I ran with the grace of God. Well, the truth is, with the grace of God, you can soar by God's grace and God's power. Paul understood that. What was it that God used to enable Paul for the ministry? His grace. God's grace is how he enabled Paul. Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, we now go to a verse that you might have on your refrigerator. It's a verse we think of, especially when we go through times when we struggle. 
Paul is giving thanks for the church, the local assembly there in Philippi, for their active part in supporting him in the ministry. They were faithful to send to him time and again, and it was a blessing to him, and he was giving expression of thanks as he closes out this epistle to the church there at Philippi. And you know it, verse 13, Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That word strengthens is our word. Same as the word enabled, same as the word strengthens in 2 Timothy 4.17. Who is giving Paul the strength to go on in ministry? And in here, Paul's talking about what? Verse 12, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, literally the one who is strengthening me. It's a present active participle. Jesus Christ is the one who is enabling me, strengthening me. To do what? To go through times of great poverty when I don't have what I even need. To go through times when I have so much and I'm blessed. Paul would stay in the home of someone who's rich and be well cared for, and then Paul would be out on the road in peril of dangers of thieves and all kinds of illness and sickness and things that he faced as he traveled bringing the gospel. He learned in situations where he had enough. He had learned in situations where he didn't have any what he needed. And yet in all of those situations, God taught him, I have learned to be full. Even if I'm empty, I'm full. If you have the grace of God, when you have nothing, you know that you have everything. And when you really tap into that, it's a tremendous enabling strength in your life. God is the one who's going to enable me. And Paul's writing this to the believers there in Philippi. And now I really see how this is broadening out to see, and we'll see it more, how it's going to touch the lives of all believers if we open up our hearts to what? God's grace to enable us to give us what we need in whatever situation we face. And we want to be ready to know that Christ is the one who's bringing God's strength into our lives. Turn to 2 Timothy, but this time chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. In the light of what we're talking about, God's strength, God's enablement, God's power in our lives... This came home to me in a new way, what Paul wrote to Timothy. Now, as Paul, we're back in 2 Timothy, we're back to the setting of Paul knows he's nearing the end. This is his final time here on earth, and he's called now to face this great opportunity to share the gospel, his own testimony, with Nero. He shared it with Agrippa, he shared it with Felix, he shared his testimony in so many opportunities. And he's writing to Timothy. He knows Timothy, Titus, Tychicus, all these other men are going to continue on. And he wants them to find what God brought home through, way, through the way of instruction to him. God is the one who will strengthen you. And so he says to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Think about this. I want you to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul wanted Timothy to understand that grace is the source through which God enables us, strengthens us, giving us what we need. And I want you, Timothy, to be strong in God's grace. What does that look like? Hmm, that's a good question. Keep your finger here. We'll come back to that question. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. I don't have any new verses for you tonight. These are all verses that we know so well. But I pray that the Spirit of God brings them together in such a way for us to understand how God wants to strengthen you to do and to be all that he wants you to do and be for his glory. God wants to do that in our life. Not just Paul, not just the preacher, not just the missionary, each and every one of us. The Apostle John opens up this gospel sharing about Jesus, the Word, in the beginning. And uh, notice in verse 14, John 1, 14, the Word, the eternal Son of God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. That can't be anything other than that. He's God. Full of grace and truth. But keep this in mind now. The Son of God is full of grace and truth. 
Now, verse 15, John the, uh, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. That, that's an interesting thing for John to say. John was related to Jesus on a human level, and he was born before Jesus on a human level. But the Spirit of God gave John the baptizer to know this is the eternal one. This is the Messiah whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. He was before me. John understood that. Verse 16. And of his fullness we have received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is full of of grace and truth, verse 14. And if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, of his fullness, the overflowing presence of God in Jesus Christ is that by which we have now received what? Grace upon grace upon grace. One pastor has said it. I love it. One preacher. It's like waves of the ocean that keep coming in. Grace upon grace. There's no limit to the grace of God. Sometimes we think, but I just asked for grace. Get on your knees and ask again, because it's grace upon grace, like the waves coming in. There's no end to it. The Son of God is full of grace and truth, and through faith in Jesus Christ, we have received his fullness, grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And that, of course, refers to the revelation of God that we've received but it also refers to the enabling grace of God in our lives, God's very power. How did Paul find that? 2 Timothy 4.17, the Lord Jesus Christ was with him. You and I have learned in the New Testament that the Lord Jesus Christ is in us by the Spirit of God who has come to dwell within the heart and life of each believer. Why? To strengthen us. God's grace renewed each day to strengthen us. For whatever it is that God's calling, I don't know what you have this week. You may have something coming up this week and you think, I just don't know how I can face this person. I don't know how I can face this situation. I don't think, put all of that human understanding aside, not that it's not important, we're real. Just remember the Lord knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Aren't you thankful for that? I am. Thank you, God. God knows. I need to put that aside and say, Lord, while I have limitations, there are no limitations to your power, your wisdom, all that you want to give me. And so, Lord, I'm just asking for grace. Help me with whatever it is that I need to face this week. God wants to give us grace. Especially, God wants to give us grace that we might be able to speak of his son, Jesus Christ. We want to be a testimony. We want to be a light. Why does God want you to bear up under the stress of the trials that are upon you so that others will see Christ in you? How will they see Christ in you? When you have God's grace just flowing through your life. You may be cracking and falling apart, and yet you are not crumbling. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. In 2 Corinthians 4, the Apostle Paul shares the gospel beginning in verse 3 down through verse 5. Beautiful verses, powerful verses. Notice in verse 6. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. That's creation. Genesis 1.1. 1.2. Let there be light. God spoke. It is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. The gospel message is the glorious knowledge, the light of God, in the knowledge of the glory of God that we find in Jesus Christ. Now, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can now say with the Apostle Paul, verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you believe the gospel. After that, you heard the word of truth. You trusted in him, Paul wrote to the Ephesian believers. God sends forth his spirit into the heart of the one who is born again. Why? That the excellency of the power may be of God who now dwells in us. So, 
Paul says in verse 8, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed. We don't know what the answer is, but we're not in despair. I don't know what the answer is, but I just know God's going to do something. Do you know what that does for the unsaved people around you when you have that kind of faith and trust in God? Not because you just, at a head knowledge, are saying what you heard the pastor say, but you've spent time in prayer and you know in your heart God's working. He's working. It's a powerful testimony. Paul said in verse 8, persecuted but not forsaken. God is with us. That's the strength he derived. In 2 Timothy 4.17, the Lord was with me to strengthen me. We're not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. They may strike us down, but they'll never remove the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's ever and always able. And by his grace in our lives, he wants to demonstrate that grace in us and through us as his dear children. So back up to chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes in verse 4, and we have such trust through Christ toward God. <laughs> Do you have that kind of trust? I tell you, not until you taste and see that the Lord is good. But as you pray and seek God's grace, and then God answers your prayer, and you see how God works, something grows inside your heart. It's called trust. Trust increases. I'm going to go back to God. We have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of our, as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. The enablement is coming from God himself, by his grace, through his son, Jesus Christ, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. Paul's going to go on to talk about the difference of the law given at Mount Sinai and the blessed ministry of the Spirit of God dispensed because of Calvary. Big difference. And a wonderful expression of God's enablement so that we have strength from God. We're sufficient. I, I can't face this. You may not be able to, but God knows exactly how to bring you through it in a way that brings great glory to Him. You may be crumbling, but if you're trusting in God to demonstrate His grace in your life, God's going to hold you up so that you are not crushed that others might see Jesus Christ in us. So now come back to 2 Timothy. You have a context. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Paul now says to Timothy, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now that you know that God wants to give you his strength, it's his grace in your life, by means of his son, grace and truth, have come through Jesus Christ, and, and he's full of grace and truth. Timothy, I want you to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This is a boldness that the child of God needs to go to God in prayer knowing that I don't have the answer, but God does. I don't have the strength, but God does. And he's going to minister it in my life as I humbly, simply, in faith wait upon him. The Lord will strengthen. Well, my encouragement to us tonight is that we would be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And if you see yourself as, I could never share the gospel or tell someone, you are looking at yourself, and you are not looking at your Savior, Jesus Christ. God wants to strengthen us and give us grace for everything we're facing, trials, troubles, persecutions, but especially that we might stand and boldly share a testimony of how Jesus Christ can save a soul. Do you believe that? He saved your soul, didn't he? Wow. Thank you, God, for saving my soul. He wants you to tell others that they might have the good news. You say, but I don't have the right words. God does. Ask for grace. But I don't have. I'm a shy person. God's not shy. Ask God for the boldness. In the early first century, the saints prayed, and the place was shaken, and they had boldness to share Jesus Christ. So I pray that our hearts will be full of this blessed truth of God's grace and that we will be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's how Paul finished his scene. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. Paul walked off the scene saying, I'm about to stand before Nero, but I want to tell you, I am like this before Nero, but Nero is like this before Jesus Christ. Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. 
Father in heaven, may we be strong in you and in the power of your might, understanding how you want to. It's your privilege, it's your purpose in this age to manifest your grace in the lives of your children. And so I pray that, Lord, we will grow in grace and be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Lord, as we go into this week, I pray that you'll help us to look to you in every situation, whatever it is that we're facing, and especially, Lord, to be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within our hearts to tell others the good news Jesus saves. And we'll give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.